Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to AJ108 Criminal Investigation. My name is Tony Farrar, and of course, I am your instructor for this semester. So this week's lecture is going to cover Chapter 21, where we're going to look at preparing for and presenting cases in court. So let's go ahead and just jump into our, our weekly lecture. So at some point at the conclusion of this investigation, everything that we've kind of learned up to this point, a final report on this case needs to be put together and written. Establishing the elements of the crime and improving the corpus delecti. Now remember what that word means. It means body of the crime, but it means more the body of the elements, not like the actual body itself, right? So establishing the elements of the crime and proving that corpus delecti are going to be extremely important because you won't be able to file the case if you can't establish the elements and you certainly won't be able to convict someone. And even the most experienced investigator at some point when you end up going to court may worry about having to testify. But the, more, the most important rule to eradicate or kind of mitigate that fear of testifying in court is to always tell the truth. And then things will just seem a little bit easier. So as we begin to look at chapter 21, preparing for and presenting cases in court, we need to understand three very important U.S. Supreme Court cases. The first one is Weeks versus United States, 1914. And if you recall, this is where um, any evidence that is obtained illegally as a result of an illegal search or, or a, a coerced confession, etc., is going to be basically thrown out. You can't use it in court on the federal level. Then came Mapp versus Ohio, 1961. And in the Mapp case, the court held, similar to Weeks, that any evidence that's obtained as the result of an unlawful uh, search and seizure or a coerced statement, etc., would in fact be excluded from, from trial but now it was applicable to the states. So now you have the Weeks case and the Mapp case combining to, kind, to make the exclusionary rule. And we're going to talk about that in, in, in just a minute. So these are applicable now in both federal and state court. And then you throw in Terry versus Ohio in 1967 that also outlines the, the issues, the challenges related to stop and frisk. So, so think about these cases as we start to go through and we look at the different components of your report. Now, the exclusionary rule mandates that evidence obtained from an illegal arrest, unreasonable search, or a coercive interrogation is going to be excluded from trial. And, and moreover, under the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, evidence is also excluded from trial if it was gained through evidence or by evidence uncovered during an illegal arrest, an unreasonable search, or a coercive interrogation. So, you know, if you find evidence that leads to other evidence, then, you know, if the first evidence was seized um, through false arrest or an illegal arrest or unreasonable search or, or coercive interrogation, then that second level or that second piece of evidence is also going to be inadmissible. So that's the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. So now let's start to look at the actual report itself. So... The effectiveness of the final report is often the determining factor in whether a case is prosecuted. It's not just skillful investigation that brings the bad guy to justice. It's the 
investigator's ability to prepare a report that can withstand the minute scrutiny by judges, by, by prosecutors, defense counsel, citizens, and yes, of course, the media. And, you know, the, the report's ability to hold up under scrutiny may determine whether the guilty go free or justice is rendered to that victim. And the final report presents the facts of the case, a, a criminal history of the person charged, the types of evidence available, and the names of those who can support such evidence by testimony in court, names of people the prosecutor can talk to for further information, and a, a chronological, in order, account of the crime and subsequent investigation. So there's a lot that we have to consider as we, we talk about the final report. And the final report contains seven sections or parts. Now, some might contain more, but we're going to kind of talk about the big seven, if you will. And that would be the complaint, the preliminary investigation report, all follow-up supplemental and progress reports, statements, admissions, and confessions, any laboratory analysis reports, all photographs, sketches, and drawings, and then finally, a summary of all negative or exculpatory evidence. Remember, that's evidence that you may find, if even if you're on the prosecution side, that could be beneficial to the defendant. That, that information is what we call exculpatory, and it needs to be turned over to the defense. So take note, the, the quality of the content and writing of the report really does influence its credibility. And that's why one of these chapters in this, uh, this textbook talks about the importance of report writing. So now let's look at each one of the, the individual areas. So the complaint. It, you need to in include a copy of the original complaint received by the, the police dispatcher or the complaint desk. And, and this should include the date and time of the actual complaint, the location of the incident, some brief details, times when officers were dispatched, and the names of the officers assigned to the initial call. And while it's called complaint in the textbook, this is actually named the call history. And so with any report that you're going to submit, you need to include a copy of the original call history because that may prove, um, you know, a as a very viable piece of evidence later on. Next, we have the preliminary investigative report. Now, the report of the officer's initial investigation at the crime scene provides essential information about the time of arrival, uh, lighting and weather conditions, any observations that they made at the scene, and immediate and subsequent actions that were taken by officers responding to the call. So it does provide essential information um, and any actions that were actually taken. Follow-up reports. Assemble each contact and follow-up report in chronological order, meaning who you contacted first, presenting the sequence of the investigation and the pattern used to follow leads. Does that make sense? Because you don't want to mix those up. You want to, because one person that you talk to might lead to another that might lead to another. So you don't want to mix those up. You want the you know, the, anybody that's reading that report, they can follow along and see the logic based on the leads that you have. So these reports contain the essential information gathered in, in improving the elements of the crime and 
in linking the crime to the suspect. And, and the reports can be also in the form of progress reports, but typically uh, they're follow-up reports. That's the name. Next would be statements, admissions, and confessions. So include the statements of all witnesses interviewed during the investigation. And we talked a little bit about that in chapter six. If written statements were not obtained, report the results of oral statements or oral interviews with any of the witnesses. Assemble all of the statements, admissions, or confessions by suspects in a separate part of the report. And this makes it just easier for the reader if you section things off and not just have things mixed up. Include the reports of any polygraphs that were given or other examinations that were used to determine the truth of statements, admissions, or confessions. And does that make sense by kind of sectioning things off? It really does help because then the reader doesn't have to flip back and forth. So it, again, it's better to kind of have these in little sections. So that would be statements, admissions, and confessions. And then laboratory reports or any other professional reports. You're going to want to assemble all laboratory results, including those from a medical examination or the autopsy report in one segment of the final report. Make recommendations regarding how these results relate to the, air, the other areas in the report. Then photographs, sketches and drawings include photographs, all photographs, sketches and drawings of the crime scene to show conditions when officers arrived and the, av the available evidence that was discovered. Uh, and we talked a lot about that back in chapter two, I believe. And then finally, the, the summary of exculpatory evidence. Include a summary of all exculpatory evidence developed during your investigation. Statements of witnesses, who claimed the suspect was elsewhere at the time of the crime are sometimes proven to be false, but the prosecution must consider such statements and develop a defense. If information exists that the suspect committed the crime, but did so in self-defense or accidentally, state this in the report. Include all recognizable weaknesses in providing the corpus delecti or the offender's identity. Write the report clearly and accurately following the guidelines that we talked about back in chapter three. Remember, the quality of the final report influences its credibility. Arrange the material in that final report in a logical sequence and in a easy to find convenient format. Now remember exculpatory evidence describes evidence which tends to justify or exonerate an accused person's actions and tends to show that they had lack of criminal intent. So if you have any of that exculpatory evidence that needs to be turned over. And it doesn't mean that your case is going to, you know, go down the drain. Um, you can find other pieces of evidence or witness statements, you know, things like that to help you bolster your case back up. But you don't want to hide this type of evidence. You want to make sure that the defense has all of this. And, and that's a really important thing. So now let's turn our attention to the role of the prosecutor. So... The prosecutor is the gatekeeper of the court system, determining which cases are prosecuted and which are not. The prosecutor is of critical importance because of the office's central position in the criminal justice system, whereas the police, defense attorneys, judges, and probation officers 
specialize in a specific phase of the criminal trial or the, the process itself, the, the duties of the prosecutor bridge all of these different areas. So, so this means that on a daily basis, the, the prosecutor is the only official typically who works with all actors of the criminal justice system. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. And at the county level, the prosecutor or, or district attorney, DA, is the chief law enforcement official. DAs may be appointed or elected and are responsible for prosecuting felonies and serious misdemeanors in the trial courts or you know, of, of their general jurisdiction. At the federal level, the prosecutor is called the U.S. Attorney, a position appointed by the, the president approved by Congress and confirmed by the Senate. Now, the ability to wield or use broad discretion is a key characteristic of prosecutors in our criminal justice system. And the, the various actors in a trial often have conflicting views about how this discretion should be used. The, the police push for, you know, harsher, harsher penalties. Uh, defense attorneys for giving their clients a break and, and for judges, you know, kind of clearing the docket. But the prosecutor, again, has to deal with all of that. So they are, in fact, considered to be the most powerful official in the court system. So, so hopefully that kind of makes, you know, a little bit of sense. So what about, you know, so, so now we know a little bit about the prosecutor. So what are some reasons for, for not going to trial or not prosecuting a case? So there are a few, but let's, let's, let's take a, a closer look at, at some of those. So some of the reasons could be that the complaint is invalid or that the prosecutor declines to prosecute after reviewing the case. Remember, the officer on the street or the detective, etc., they only need probable cause to arrest, but the prosecutor needs proof beyond a reasonable doubt to convict. And if they don't really have that in the case, there's a good chance that they're not going to continue with filing or prosecuting that case. Um, and next, the next one could be that the complainant or the victim might refuse to prosecute. And sometimes that happens where you might make an arrest and then somebody changes their mind, uh, whether it be, um, let's say, a fist fight between two people, kind of a mutual combat thing. And sometimes, unfortunately, even in domestic violence cases where initially there's an arrest made, but then uh, the party does not want to prosecute. Um, another reason could be that the, the offender, the suspect, passes away. They die. So there really is no reason to continue on and, and, and to go to trial. And then finally, um, well, another one, the offender is in prison or out of the country and, and, and can't be returned. So you may have to hold that case. And then finally, no evidence or leads exist or, or not enough evidence. And it's not uncommon for an officer to complete a report and they may think it's thorough enough and, and they make an arrest and they send over all the information and, and maybe the prosecutor thinks there's just not enough or they just need to do a little bit of follow-up. So they'll send back uh, a sheet from the DA's office that says, in order to get this case filed, we're going to need you to do A, B, and C, and then send that back to our office, and then we'll, we'll reevaluate the case. And that, and that happens quite often. So maybe the prosecutor just wants a little bit more clarification or information on a particular subject. Now, once the decision is made to prosecute a case, more than probable cause is required. 
You see, the prosecution must prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, the degree of proof, we've talked about this, to obtain a conviction. Now, to do so, the prosecution must know what evidence it can introduce, what witnesses will testify, the strength and weaknesses of the case, and the type of testimony police investigators can supply. So as we talk about preparing a case for prosecution, here's some of the steps that you're going to need to take in order to prepare this case. So first you're going to want to, well, let me, let me, I'll just read them and then we're going to kind of look at each one. So you're going to need to review evidence. You're going to need to evaluate your evidence, review all reports, prepare your witnesses. You're going to want, you're going to complete that final report. And then you're going to hold what they call a, a, is a pretrial conference with the prosecutor. So again, remember, each crime consists of one or more elements that must be proven. And the statutes and the ordinances of that particular jurisdiction are going to define those elements. So you're going to want to concentrate on proving the elements of the crime and establishing the, the offender's identity. So we're going to start off with our first step, um, you know, to prepare a case for court, and that's review and evaluate evidence. So review physical evidence to ensure that it has been properly gathered, identified, transported, and safeguarded between the time it was obtained and the time of the trial. Make sure that evidence is available for the trial and is taken to the courtroom and turned over to the prosecuting attorney. The, the pre-trial discovery process requires the prosecution and defense to disclose to, to each other certain evidence that they intend to use at trial, thus avoiding surprises, because it's not like in the movies where you have some piece of evidence that you've held on to, and then you're just going to jump up and go, you know, surprise, and, and, and here you go. So uh, again, these are, these are things that we need to understand. So this pretrial discovery process, again, requires that the prosecution and the defense disclose to each other uh, certain evidence that they intend to use at trial, avoiding surprises because it's not, again, like on TV. And, and remember, earlier in our lecture, we talked about the case Brady versus Maryland. So this landmark Supreme Court case in the discovery process is Brady versus Maryland, in which the court held the suppression by the prosecution of evidence favorable to the accused upon request violates due process where the evidence is material either to guilt or to punishment irrespective of the good faith or bad faith of the prosecution so really uh, again these are important factors that we have to understand next would be reviewing your report so we've talked a little bit about evidence but now we, we're going to take our next step and we're going to review the report. Re, re, you know, review written reports of, of everything done during the investigation. This includes the preliminary report, uh, memorandums, summary reports, progress reports, evidence records and any receipts, photographs, sketches, the medical examiner's report. Um, emergency EMS records, laboratory test reports on evidence, statements of witnesses, both positive and negative, and any other reports on actions that were taken during the investigation. And this also includes the transcript of your own deposition. The, the deposition gets 
typed up. And if you're like most law enforcement officers, you get it, but you never read it, though you are entitled to. So a lot of times there will be this deposition where you go into a, it, it's a non-binding type situation where uh, two attorneys, uh, one for each side show up and you're asked certain questions. And, and you can read that report and it's important that you do. Now, it's also not uncommon for a year or more to pass between the time you give a deposition and the time you are called as a witness during a criminal trial. And the defense attorney will be waiting for your testimony to contradict even a little bit. Any statements made in your deposition, you know, if they're not consistent with what you said in your report, uh, may not look right. So that's why it's important to review every single report that you can. Next would be to prepare witnesses. So re-interview witnesses to refresh their, their recollection or their memories. Read their previous statements or read their statements to them and ask if this evidence, um, you know, or if this is the evidence that they're going to present in court or the testimony. And such a review also helps basically mitigate any fears witnesses might have about testifying. Describe to the witnesses, help them out. Uh, describe to them the trial procedures so that they, they understand what's going to happen and explain that they can testify only to the facts of their own personal knowledge or common knowledge. So they can't testify about what somebody else did. All right, so it's going to have to be their own uh, personal knowledge. Emphasize also that they must tell the truth and present the facts as they know them or as they believe them to be. Explain the importance of, of remaining calm and, and also having a neat, clean appearance and presenting some impartiality, meaning be impartial, remain impartial, don't become argumentative. So kind of walk them through what's going to happen from the beginning on how they're going to swear the person in to where they're going to sit, uh, to what the prosecutor might do, and etc. So that way they, they feel more comfortable. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. So next would be the pretrial conference. Before testifying in court and after you have made the, the final case preparation, arrange for a, a pretrial conference with the prosecuting attorney. Organize the facts and evidence and prepare a summary of your investigation. Include in this summary the focal points and the main issues of the case and an envelope containing copies of all reports and all other uh, you know relevant documents discuss any complicated or detailed information fully to avoid any misunderstanding discuss any any legal questions concerning the admissibility of evidence or testimony the prosecutor may be able to offer some insight into the style the defense attorney might use as well as the judge hearing the case. Sometimes witnesses are included in the pretrial conference, but not always. If so, listen carefully to what each witness says to the prosecuting attorney and to what the prosecuting attorney says in response. And during the trial, the judge may exclude all witnesses from the courtroom except that person, that one person that's going to testify. And that's a practice called sequestering. Therefore, you may not have any opportunity to hear the testimony of the other witnesses or the approach used by the, the attorneys. Does that kind of make sense? Because if they sequester, you can't see or hear. So if you're there at the pretrial conference and there's a witness that's speaking, listen to what they're going to say. It's also a good idea to review the case with other officers that are going to testify. You may not hear their actual testimony 
and it, it will help you to know if in advance perhaps what they're going to say and what they're going to testify to. So again, review all the evidence, discuss the strengths and weaknesses of the case, and discuss the, the possible line of questioning by the prosecutor and the defense. These are things that you're going to do in that pretrial conference that are really going to help you out. And, and then, of course, you're going to write the final report. So here, just to kind of give you an example, is a, a little schematic of how a report might move through uh, the different stages. Um, and you can find that in your textbook as well. So now we're going to move into final preparations. So we're still preparing our case for prosecution here, but we're going to be a little bit more specific and talk about the final preparations before the trial. So shortly before the trial, again, if you can, review your notes and your final report. Take with you only those notes that you want to use as part of your testimony. Don't carry a bunch of stuff in there. Be certain the physical evidence is being taken to the courtroom and is going to be available for the prosecuting attorney when he or she needs it. If you are asked to bring physical evidence with you to the trial, use an appropriate container to you know, kind of prevent people from seeing exactly what it is. Know what is expected as far as the rules of the court. When an officer receives a subpoena and an order to appear before the court, it may not indicate what kind of hearing it's going to be. I mean, it actually it could be a grand jury hearing or a preliminary hearing, or it could be a criminal trial. I mean, sometimes I've seen subpoenas, and a lot of times, actually, they might have some information on there, but it really isn't specific. And the rules of evidence are different as is the burden of proof required based on the type of hearing it's, that's going to be held. If the subpoena does not specify the type of hearing, call the prosecutor or the, the attorney who sent the subpoena to determine the nature. What kind of hearing am I going to be involved in? And the subpoena will also or usually indicate whether the officer is to make a, a personal appearance or be on call, meaning that the officer doesn't need to appear personally unless they are called by the prosecution. Be familiar with any pretrial rulings that the judge has made. So you don't want to violate those. And then you're going to want to dress appropriately. Most police departments have regulations regarding what you're supposed to wear when you go to court. Now, some departments specify that officers should appear in uniform. If you wear street clothes, dress conservatively. Avoid super bright colors and, and big large plaids or, or polka dots. And I'm really not sure why you would wear polka dots, but okay. Um, do not overdo on accessories. And avoid, I'm just going to say, your textbook kind of refers to this as bizarre. I'm going to say funky because I like the word funky. So, okay, different haircuts, all right? Um, and usually there's policies at police departments on how you can have your hair done as well. Do not wear dark or deeply tinted sunglasses. Your, your appearance really does reflect your attitude and your professionalism and will have a definite impact on the jury. Because remember, the jury is the trier of what? Facts. And therefore, they can judge you. They can judge your credibility. Um, they can judge the way you look, how you answer, um, all of that. So this is why you need to maintain that professional attitude. And then finally, be on time. Okay, there's nothing worse than being late to a court hearing. If you're delayed for any reason, 
get a hold of the prosecutor or the court clerk and explain the reason and give a time when you can be expected. It's possible that the prosecutor can put a different witness on before you. Otherwise, you're going to hold up the trial. So please, please do your best to be on time. And, and here's a, another um, kind of chart that shows, um, you know, the, the different sequences as far as presentation. So we talked about dress uh, for a moment. Be professional. Um, you can wear your firearm in court. That's okay. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. You can wear a hat just when you get in to testify, take it off. Okay. A lot of uh, class A uniforms have a tie um, and you're not going to be like Lieutenant Dangle. Okay. Um, you're not going to wear shorts or you shouldn't. Okay. Or anything kind of weird like that. All right. So now let's move into discussing the actual trial. So trials occur within a construct called the adversary system, which establishes clearly defined roles for both the prosecution and the defense and sets the judge as that neutral party. And, and, and that kind of makes sense. So the, it is adversarial. It's the prosecution versus the defense, right? Um, and the judge is going to be the, the rule of what, you know, or, or, the, or the decider of what? So of law, so not of facts, of law, meaning what type of evidence is going to get in, etc. So this, again, this has important implications for the investigator who is on the side of the prosecutor in the proceedings as well, and we'll talk about that. So let's look now at the, the different players, if you will, the main participants of a trial. And we're just going to touch on them for times, you know, because of time. So we have the judge or the magistrate and, and these folks preside over the trial. They determine whether a witness is qualified and competent. They address questions of law, including motions, objections, and procedures, um, rules of the admissibility of evidence. They keep order and they interpret the law for the jurors and they pass sentence if the defendant is found guilty. Next would be the jurors. The jurors hear and evaluate the testimony of all witnesses and, and they are called the fact finders. So we talked about that. And jurors consider many factors other than the spoken word. And this is important, the attitude and behavior of witnesses, suspect and suspects and attorneys are consistently under the jury's scrutiny. Jurors notice how witnesses respond to questions and their attitudes toward the prosecution and the defense. Jurors reach their verdict based on what they see, hear, and feel during the trial. Typical jurors will have limited or no experience with the criminal justice system outside of what they perhaps have read in the newspaper or seen on TV um, or the movies. Next would be legal counsel. Legal counsel presents the prosecution and defense evidence before the court and jury. Lawyers act as um, kind of checks against each other and present the case as required by court procedure and the rulings of the presiding judge. Defendants may or may not take the witness stand. The Fifth Amendment, hopefully you know this and you should, protects defendants against self-incrimination. Now, if a defendant chooses not to testify, this fact cannot be used against him or her. However, if a defendant does choose to testify, waiving the privilege against self-incrimination, that defendant cannot tell only part of the story. 
If a defendant testifies, the state can ask questions about all of the facts surrounding the event testified to. In addition, once the defendant takes the stand, the state can impeach the defendant's credibility by introducing any prior felony convictions. And a jury might become suspicious if a defendant chooses not to testify on their own behalf. But the defense attorney might decide it's, it's safer to keep the accused off the stand than to open them up to potentially damaging cross-examination. So we're not supposed to hold, or the jury is not supposed to hold it against a defendant if they choose not to testify, because they have that right against self-incrimination. But the jury might assume, and the jury has this right to think this way if they want, they might assume that because the person isn't testifying, that there might that they might be somewhat guilty. Does that kind of make sense? Um, so the defense attorney is going to have to kind of work that information in. And then next we have witnesses. And witnesses present the facts as they know them. To, to qualify as a witness, a person must have relevant information, must be competent, and must declare that he or she will testify truthfully. So to be competent, a witness must be able to remember and tell what happened, must be able to distinguish fact from fantasy, and must know that he or she must tell the truth. So that's typically, um, these are some of the the main participants um, in, in the trial. So we've kind of gone through them, um, and I've also listed them for you. So we don't have to go back through each one, uh, but we can kind of summarize them if you want. And, and the reason I did it this way is because this is an important, the sequence of events here, or those that are involved. So remember the judge or the ma magistrate, they preside over the trial. They, they determine whether a witness is qualified, etc. Remember, the judge or the magistrate, they are the trier of law. Now, the jurors, again, they hear and evaluate testimony. They are the triers of fact or the fact finders. And they consider many factors other than just testimony. The legal counsel, they, they, per, they present the evidence for both sides, the prosecution and the defense. The defendants, they may or may not take the stand to testify. Witnesses, remember, they present facts as they know them. So, so now what's the sequence of a, of a criminal trial? And, and you can see that you, you have kind of a sequence over here um, as far as going through the, the process, the court process. But what about that actual sequence in a criminal trial? So a trial begins with the case being called from the court docket. And if both the prosecution and the defense are ready, meaning they're, they've reviewed everything and they're ready to go and all their witnesses, et cetera, are, you know, everybody's there, the case is then presented before the court. If not, then they may have to uh, do something a little bit different. So... Again, if, if the trial is before a judge without a jury, it's called a bench trial. And if the trial is before in front of a jury, it's called a jury trial. So let's take a quick look at the, the sequence of events that, that happen in, the, you know, in, in this criminal trial. So first you would have jury selection. Then you'll have opening statements by the prosecution and the defense. You'll have the, the main case, the presentation of the prosecution's case, the, their case in chief, if you will. And during that, remember, even though it's the prosecution presenting their case, the defense can still cross-examine witnesses, etc. And then you'll have the, when the, when the prosecution rests their case in chief, you'll have the defense present their case. And then remember that the prosecution can also 
cross-examine witnesses as the defense presents their case. And this is, you know, we have rebuttal and sura rebuttal testimony. So we have rebuttal to rebuttal. But just remember that they can cross-examine each other. And then finally, you'll have when, when they rest their case, uh, when the defense rests, you're going to have closing statements by the prosecution and the defense. After that, you will have instructions to the jury. And then you will have the jury deliberation where they go off to another room and they discuss the case in order to reach a verdict. Then you, next you will have the reading of that verdict to the court and it's done in open court. And then finally, you will have either an acquittal, meaning the person is found not guilty, or you will have a guilty verdict and you'll have the passing of sentence. Now, a lot of times, just keep this in mind, courts, they, they don't pass the sentence right away. Okay, so they're going to come back with a guilty or a non-guilty verdict. And then if it's, a, if it's a guilty verdict, they will set a separate hearing called a sentencing hearing. But kind of what I mean right here is they're going to come back, they're going to read the verdict, and it's going to be an acquittal or it's going to be something different like, like a guilty verdict, okay? So hopefully that kind of makes sense. So what are some guidelines? Just a couple of extra different things to talk about. Some guidelines while you wait to testify. So let's say that the trial's going on and, and you can't go in the room, in the courtroom, because they've excluded all witnesses. So do not discuss the case while waiting in the hallway to testify. If a juror or another witness hears your statements, you may have created grounds for a mistrial. And although it may be impractical or impossible to avoid all contact with everybody, with jurors, or even other members of the defense team, such as, you know, chance encounters in a crowded elevator or passing people in the hallway, what we call de minimis um, or little, uh, you know, communication, a simple hello or, you know, giving directions is okay. It's important just to remember not to discuss the case or actually, just an, another idea, don't be, you know, be friendly. So, you know, if it's a simple hello, hello, sir, how are you? And that's it. Giving directions. Don't appear unfriendly. And think about it. Why would you not talk about that particular case? Again, you know, it, it could cause a mistrial. So we have to be very careful about what we do when we're waiting for, um, you know, for your turn to testify. So now let's take a few minutes and let's talk about testimony. So as you enter the courtroom, keep in mind your goal, which is similar to that sought on the street, is to win. I mean, that's really, you, you don't go there to lose. However, this does not mean winning the case, but instead winning the trust of the court and the jury. You basically and what you've done are all there, you know, you're, that's also on trial. The way you treated the suspects, how you followed policy and procedure, and your professional demeanor and knowledge, all of this is on trial. You know, I mean, they, they all factor into whether the jury is going to, to trust and believe you or, or, you know, to win, really, the jury is going to need to find you credible. So your success as an investigator depends not only on conducting a thorough investigation and, and making a good arrest and, and producing a, a well-written you know, report, a well-documented report, and those are all important. But also, it depends, you know, it, it lies on presenting yourself on the stand as a competent and credible witness. 
Because first impressions, they really are critical. Know what you're going to do when you enter the courtroom. When your name is called, answer here or present and move directly to the front of the courtroom. Don't walk between the prosecutor and the judge. Go behind the attorneys. Never walk in front of the judge or between the judge and the attorney's table. This is kind of, this is an area that they, that is referred to as, as the well. And, and it's kind of like a, an off limits area. And if you have notes or a report, carry them in a, in a clean folder in your left hand. So your right hand is free for taking the oath. Remember, you're going to get sworn in. And taking the oath in court is basically the same as taking your oath of office. You know, stand straight and face the clerk of the court, holding the palm of your hand towards the clerk. Use a clear, firm voice to answer, I do, to the question, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Don't say, yeah. Say, I do, and let people hear you. You know, do not look at the judge, either legal counsel or the jury. Sit with your back straight, but in a comfortable position, usually with your hands folded in your lap or held on the arms of the chair. And, and don't wiggle around in the chair, which a lot of us tend to do. We kind of fidget, but we just, sometimes we don't think we're doing it. It's just kind of one of those things we do. Um, hold notes and other reports in your lap as well, or set them nicely on the counter in front of you. And if these reports are bulky, you know, or there's a lot of them, many experts um, on testifying recommend placing them under the chair until you need them. But typically, I would just set my folder uh, just right on top of the counter in front of me and then not play around with it. And the witness chair in all courtrooms is positioned so that you can face the judge, legal counsel, jury, or the audience, depending upon who your answers are being directed to. So hopefully that those, those things will help you uh, when it comes to testimony. So what about you know, when we talk about testifying, what are some things that are inadmissible or inadmissible statements? What, what, what is included in there? Um, things like opinions and conclusions. Unless you're an expert, then you can give an opinion. Hearsay evidence, which is what other people said. So you're testifying about what somebody else said. The courts would prefer that that person actually comes in to say it. Any type of privileged communication or statements about character and reputation, including the defendant's criminal record. So again, testify only to what you actually saw, heard, or did, not to what you believe, heard from others, or were told about. Now, you can testify to what a defendant told you directly. But any other statements must be testified to by the person making them. So if the defendant said something directly to you, that's fine. But if it's from if somebody else said something to you, that's that's different. And here preparation is the key to being a good witness. After a review of your your notes and all relevant reports, you will be familiar with the case and you can tell it like it is. And, and this will come across well to the jury and help you establish your your credibility. So a couple of things that you're going to want to do. So some guidelines for effective testimony. Speak clearly, firmly, and with expression. Not necessarily with your hands, although some of us tend to do that. Answer direct or answer questions directly. Don't volunteer information. Just give the information that relates to the question. Pause briefly before you answer. Think about what the question is. 
and then go ahead and, and make your answer. Refer to your notes if you don't recall exact details. Admit calmly when you don't know an answer or you don't remember. It, it, it's okay to say, hey, you know what? I, I, I don't remember. So it's okay. And then you're going to get a chance to refer to your report. Admit any mistakes that you make in testifying. It's okay to mess up. Avoid police jargon, and we've learned about that. Any sarcasm, you're not going to get up there and open with a one-liner because um, you're on, you know, because tonight is, uh, you know, joke night or something like that. And any humor. Don't be robotic, but you're not going to, don't show sarcasm and use police jargon. And then again, tell the truth as you know it to be. How you speak is often as important is as what you say. Talk slowly, deliberately, and loudly enough to be heard by everyone. Never use obscenity or vulgarity unless the court requests you know, a suspect or a victim's exact statement. Th then you can go ahead and say that. You know, in such cases, inform the court before you answer um, that there's going to be some obscenity or vulgarity. Um, ignore the courtroom's atmosphere. Devote your entire attention to giving truthful answers to the questions. Answer all questions directly and politely with yes or no. I used to say yes, sir, or no, sir, or yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am, unless asked to relate an action taken, an observation made, or information told to you directly by the defendant. Refer to the judge as your honor, not judge, and to the defendant as the defendant, not Mr. Jones. Do not volunteer information. Again, instead, let the prosecution decide whether to pursue a particular line of questioning. Again, take a few seconds after hearing the question before you give your answer. And, it, and, and of course, review the case thoroughly before your courtroom appearance. Now, along with some of the things that we just went over are going to be some nonverbal factors. Some of these things that I think are really important for, for you to know. So don't under, underestimate the power of nonverbal factors as you testify. More than 25 years ago, Dr. Albert Merhabam, back in 1981, conducted his famous often cited study at the University of California, LA, and concluded what, or, or that communication is made up of several components. What is said, meaning the actual words that are spoken, how it is said, the tone of voice, the pitch, the, the modulation, and nonverbal factors, which would be body language or gestures or demeanor. Thus, the bulk of a message is conveyed not through the words that are being used, but how they're being delivered. So never overlook the importance of how you present information and those nonverbal factors when testifying. So think of um, all of these as we kind of look through them. And let me see where I'm going to go. Okay. So some nonverbal factors could be dress, um, eye contact, posture, gestures and mannerisms, your rate of speech, don't speak too fast, your tone of voice, and even your facial expressions. Make eye contact with the jury often while testifying. Be aware that those facial expressions might indicate displeasure or even arrogance. Avoid, um, you know, actions associated with deception like putting your hand over your mouth or rubbing your nose or straightening your hair, buttoning your coat picking lint off your clothes or any of those things that are going to, they're going to annoy the jury. So again, um, look at the percentages. When we talk about nonverbal factors, what is said 7% of the message, 
how it is said, 38% of the message, and nonverbal, 55% of the message. So understand that. So what about now as we start to kind of wind down in our lecture here, what are some strategies for excelling as a witness? Well, to excel as a witness, set yourself up. Provoke the defense into giving you a chance to explain. Be unconditional and do not stall. Also, having some type of training uh, will help you become an expert in a certain area. So expert testimony is that type of testimony presented by a person deemed to have specialized training and skills or experience in a particular area that will help the jury understand the topic and evidence presented. So you could be an expert in gangs and then you can give an opinion if you're an expert, remember? Uh, you could be an expert in narcotics not just detection, but maybe for sale or under the influence. You can be an expert in auto theft, an expert in homicide investigation. So there are many different areas. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a degree, but you have to have had specialized training in that particular area. So again, officers who qualify as experts in an area are allowed to give their opinions and conclusion, but the prosecution must qualify the officer as an expert on the stand in front of everybody. And the prosecution must establish that the person has special knowledge that others of moderate education or experience in the same field just don't have. So to qualify as an expert witness, one must have a couple of the following things that we're going to look at. Uh, present or prior employment, present, sorry, present, or prior employment in, the, in a specific field. Active membership in a professional group in that field. Maybe some research work in that field. Um, even an educational degree di directly related to the field. Um, direct experience, which is the most important with that particular field. And then any type of uh, papers or books or writings um, that you've written regard or, or, or taught about in that particular field. So again, there's a lot of different, a, a lot of different things. So a little bit of an overview when we talk about testimony again, Display an even temperament, be likable and polite, maintain eye contact, never volunteer any information, and of course, anticipate defense attorney tactics. So a couple of last real quick things, how to handle objections. So if, if you're testifying and let's say that one of the attorneys objects. So how to avoid objections would be to avoid conclusions. So just testify to the facts. Avoid non-responsive answers, meaning that you're talking about something other than what the question was. And answer yes or no questions with yes or no, not with some long drawn out statement. And, and here are three common objections that you might see in testifying. The first one is, is an objection to the form of the question. And this is arguing the question as asked um, is leading, speculative, argumentative. It misstates facts and evidence. It assumes facts not in evidence. It's vague and ambiguous, repetitive, cumulative, or misleading. Now, these are the legal you know, legal definitions. So one objection, again, to the form of the question. And next, the next one would be to the substance of the question, arguing that the question is irrelevant. It's immaterial. It calls for hearsay. 
it has an insufficient foundation. It calls for an inadmissible opinion or, or it's beyond the scope of this direct examination. And then finally, objection to the answer in that it is either unresponsive or inadmissible opinion or an inadmissible hearsay statement. So concluding your testimony, don't leave the stand until you are told. So just because you think the prosecutor is done, don't just get up and go, you know, and then drop the mic and then leave. Okay, wait until you are excused. The judge or the magistrate will, ex ex you know, will excuse you. The prosecutor will basically say no more, you know, no further questions, your honor. The defense will say no further questions, your honor. And then the judge will look at you and say, therefore, the witness is excused. Thank you for your service or, or however they say it. Then you will return to your seat if you're at one of the attorney's tables or in the courtroom, or if it's, you know, if the courtroom is excluding witnesses, you will leave the room. Don't take the outcome personally. And then finally, the victim or the complainant at some point should be notified of the disposition of the case. So a couple of, you know, one thought as, as we're winding and we're almost done as, as we talk about testifying, and this is some advice on testifying from a seasoned officer of the year investigator. And, and he emphasizes three major areas, preparation, communication, and credibility. The truth can only strengthen a good case. So in summary, the most important rule to basically reduce fear or get rid of fear of testifying in court is to always tell the truth. Remember, the prosecutor is the most powerful official in the court system. A criminal trial begins with jury selection. The, the win for an investigator who testifies is not just necessarily the win, but it, it's to establish or have established credibility. And the disposition of a case should be made known to the complainant as soon as practical after the disposition of the case. So that's going to wrap it up. We made it in one lecture. So that's great. So this will conclude our chapter 21 lecture on preparing for and presenting cases in court.